turn with me, if you please, to Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. <clears throat> I shall be reading to you from a version with which you are unfamiliar and you will kindly follow in whatever version that you have. So, as God's holy chosen ones and having been loved, put on great sympathy, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing one another and forgiving each other if anyone has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, you forgive as well. Above all of these, love which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of the Christ rule in your hearts to the which you were actually called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of the Christ indwell among you richly, teaching and admonishing yourself with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with grace in your heart, singing to God. And everything whatsoever you do, speaking or acting, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father, through him. As is true of so many passages in Paul's letters, this passage begins with a connective, so. In other words, what Paul has to say to us in these verses follows from what he said in the previous verses. There he laid strong emphasis on the fact that the church of Christ is one. And in the church, there is a difference. Now this was quite an extraordinary thought in those days. No difference. No difference between a slave and a slave owner. No difference between a Jew and a Gentile. Indeed, no difference between male and female. And Paul's answer is no. There may be differences outside of the church, but there are no differences and there is no room to make differences in the church. But living in the church, particularly when there are differences, isn't easy isn't meant to be easy. Now, that may be surprising because, after all, what we look for is comfort. We come to church, or we go wherever we go, in order to have our needs met, have our sorrows soothed, have our pains healed. Well, if that is a fair description of why we come to church, and that is all we have to say about why we come to church, then we come to church for the wrong reasons. Because above all, we should come to the church, as our Lord said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And above all, we come to church to give God his due. And we cannot give God his due without relating to one another gospel-wise. So then, says Paul, and this is how he tells us we should live at church. First of all, since there is no place for any distinctions within the church, but Christ is everything, he is in all and he is all, we are to put on, as those who have been loved by God, in spite of what we are, in spite of what we have done, in spite of what we ought to have done, in spite of what we ought to have been and are not, have not done, and yet God loved us and included us amongst his holy chosen ones. And therefore, 
having been loved, we are to put on great sympathy, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing one another and forgiving each other if anyone has a complaint against another. Paul is spelling out the implications, the practical implications of what grace means and how we are to live it out in the context of our lives together in the church. We are God's holy chosen ones and therefore we are to act as such. God looked upon us down from the corridors of eternity. He saw all our weaknesses, all our faults, all our shortcomings and yet he set his love upon us. And he separated us for himself. He made us his very own and to that end he sent his son. They did not, we did not choose him. He chose them, he chose us. And we now love because he first loved us. It is now our duty to love our fellow Christians by putting on the characteristics of true love, all of which are necessary for us to live together as a body in Christ. Put on. This is not something God does for us. This is something that we must do. We can't wait, we can't pray for love. We need to go out in love. We can't pray for sympathy, we have to learn sympathy. God will not insert humility into our lives. We are going to have to learn it, work at it. It's like driving, playing the piano, cooking or whatever else it might be. Put on, says Paul. And therefore he's laying a burden of responsibility upon each and every one of us who have tasted of the Lord and seen that he is good. And what are we to put on? First of all, he says, sympathy. Sympathy is the ability to feel pathos, sim pathos, to feel with others to see things from their point of view, it is the opposite of selfishness. It's the concern for other people's welfare at least as much as we care for our own. And of course, when we come to church with that kind of an attitude, church suddenly blossoms into a place of great comfort and mutual edification. Put on, he says, sympathy. Sympathy is necessary for people of diverse backgrounds, assumptions, preferences, hopes, expectations to live together in gospel harmony. An openness to one another, to each other's cultures, a willingness to bear with radically different personalities, and a realization that our way of thinking may be right, but it is never the only right way to think. There is, what's the saying, more than one way to skin a cat? There's more than one way to do this or that or the other, however valid it may be. Sympathy. Looking at things from the other person's point of view. Taking into consideration the needs of others so that we do not selfishly come to church because our needs or those most closest to us are not met. But rather so that we could reach out to those who are beside us. And when we are all busy reaching out to each other, God is glorified and the gospel is preached by the way we relate to one another. And of course, sympathy brings to Grace's next requirement, kindness. A good 
natured willingness to please others and do them well. The relationship between this kind of kindness and a sympathy is, I'm sure, obvious. Think of Christ. Think of his kindness. Think of his humble generosity. He who is equal to his father in every iota of Godhood. Perfect, holy, happy. And yet as we sing, he left his father's throne above. Is he not the epitome of the kind of generous kindness of which Paul speaks, this good-natured willingness to meet the needs of others and to please them? Church life is one of those important contexts, after the family the most important context, in which we have both the opportunity and the need for kindness. It's where we give ourselves to others for God's sake. It's like a family, but to only a slight or lesser degree, it means that we are concerned for others, and that concern is what oils the hinges of our relationship and transforms each relationship into an experience of, of the gospel, of grace, of God's giving. Kindness leads us to be alert, to be aware of, to be sensitive to others and to their needs. Kindness means that we give others leeway, that we forgive them liberally when they err. Kindness means that we do not act as if the world or the family or the church revolves around us. Kindness makes us patience under trial and generous when ourselves in need. Kindness is simply Christ-likeness. It's living out the gospel. And then the next characteristic to which the gospel calls us through Paul. Humility. Once again, I think the relationship between humility and uh, the previous qualities is quite obvious. Sympathy and kindness are the product of humility because humility is what teaches us to love our fellow humans as we love ourselves. In other words, it's the opposite of selfishness, self-centeredness. Humility reminds us that others are worth as much and as dear to God as much as we might consider ourselves to be. It's what enables husbands to love their wives and wives to accept their husbands' leadership, parents to respect their children and children to follow their parents' lead by obeying their loving gospel demands. Pride, on the other hand, is one of the most destructive forces on the face of the earth. It lay at the root of all imperialistic aspirations. Pride destroys families, it rends churches and paves a straight path to hell. And there is no room for pride in the church. And we need to remind ourselves how Christ humbled himself, became one of us, underwent our own temptations, experienced our mocking and our rejection, bore our sins, suffered, died and was buried. His humility for our sakes surely should be the grounds and the motivation of ours before God and in relation one to another. Next, Paul calls us Christians to meekness. In Roman times, meekness was a fault. Prowess was either military or political or economic and social. Very often these were all intertwined one with another. Morality 
a, a humble fear of God. Unselfish liberality, these were looked upon as evidences of feebleness of heart, of weakness. Today's values hardly differ. What are successful churches if not powerful churches, rich churches? What are successful people, if not people who have so much money in the bank they can't count it? Paul calls the Colossians, and through them he calls us, to go against the grain of their society and ours, and of society's values, and dare to be Christian. In other words, dare to be Christ-like. And this, of course, goes against the grain of our own values because it is so difficult to be known at work, for example, as meek. But true Christ-motivated meekness is not weakness. It takes a large degree of emotional security to agree to appear to be weak to those who are around us. Nor is meekness an expression of our inability to cope with reality, a lack of ambition or of drive. Meek individuals can be ambitious, they can be highly motivated, as was our Lord himself, who aspires to be and will yet be manifestly king of all the earth through the cross. A meek person is gentle, not self-assertive, although he may be capable of projecting uh, a sense of rectitude and authority that will move others to submit to him. I was listening to a preacher today, we shall not mention his name, a well-known preacher, who began with, I want you to look at and I thought to myself, who on earth do you think you are that you have to tell me what you want? I'm not interested in what you want. I want to hear what God wants of us. Living together as we are, in the family, in church, or in society, inevitably involves a good deal of compromise. Even when we think we're right. We often need to compromise until others come, if they ever come, to see things from our point of view. And what is more, in the process of our waiting, our own minds may well change, as often they need to change. Of course, we don't compromise on fundamental principles. But on the other hand, we would be foolhardy, arrogant, to make everything an issue that is so fundamental that we cannot compromise on it. We must respect each other's liberties at the same time that we respect their own sense of duty. And uh, living together in the family, in the church, or in society requires the kind of meekness that does not impose one's personality or one's preferences upon another, but makes room for the kind of frank, and respectful, gracious discussion that sometimes results in a continued disagreement. Did our Lord not exemplify precisely that? And should his example not be both a beacon and a call for us? His meekness should be the grounds and the motivation of ours as we relate to God and to one another. Next to meekness, of course, is patience. Meekness leads to patience, which in this case Paul describes as bearing one another and forgiving each other if anyone has a complaint against anyone. Patience means that we bear each other. And it's not a kind of grin and bear it kind of bearing. It's the kind of loving, humble, meek, sympathetic, gracious bearing that does so out of a recognition of the fact that 
we are no more perfect than the person bearing us. In fact, we bear him, he bears us. As James puts it, we all stumble in many ways. The truth is, there are no angels in heaven, and I keep reminding my wife, angels do not wed. If we only remembered that, we might be spared many a disappointment in the family or in the church, because both are challenging, edifying, and sanctifying, humbling experiences in which iron sharpens iron. Friction, not comfort. Beloved friends, the point to which we are not challenged, the point to which we strive for comfort is the level of our lack of sanctification. It is precisely where we're challenged, where friction smooths the sharper corners of our personality, of our convictions, of our conduct, that we are made more Christ-like. And therefore, that is what we should be striving for. Bearing one another means that we forgive each other if we have a complaint against each other, and human reality makes it clear that we do often offend one another, unintentionally or otherwise. And so often we have complaints against one another, not all of which are justified, but all of which we feel very strongly. Now the if we have complaints against one another here is not a, a, an if of condition, it is an if of contingency. We would better translate it since we have complaints one against another. And I dare say that is not something I need to labor to prove. How should forgiveness be granted? Well, Paul answers that question. Just as the Lord forgave you, you forgive as well. The Gospel teaches us that we should relate to one another as God chose to relate to us. We should treat one another as God chose to treat us. He prepared the grounds of our forgiveness. Although he had a well-established grievance against us, he wooed us with his kindness. And yet we failed repeatedly. We fail even today. And yet he continues to forgive us with a liberality that just boggles the mind, transcends all imagination. Well then, just as the Lord forgave you, you forgive as well. Above all these, says Paul, as it were a cloak that is to cover and encompass it all, put on love. And of course, true love is expressed with all these characteristics. It's the motive behind them. But think with me about the context. The context puts meaning into the text. Why on earth should a slave love his master? Why should a Jew love a Gentile or a Gentile a Jew? And the answer is because of the gospel. Because God first loved us. Because the gospel calls us out of every nation and every social status, out of every conviction and out of every background, every assumption, to love one another by the grace of God, by the power of the gospel, and by the moving of the Spirit. Put on love. And it is that kind of love which becomes the perfect bond. That is what holds us together in spite of our differences, in spite of the difference of our expectations from one another or from the church. The perfect bond. Nothing binds better than true love. Nothing binds us better to one another in spite of our faults and theirs. Nothing moves us to care for them more and less for ourselves. Nothing moves us more to bear with them, and to sacrifice for them, more than love. It is indeed the perfect bond. 
And therefore, rather than engaging in conflict and competition, uh, in a tendency to compare ourselves with others, our families with other families, our church with other churches, Paul calls upon the Colossians, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In other words, be at peace with one another in the teeth of reality by virtue of the gospel. The same kind of peace that God established with us. Could there be a greater difference that you can imagine than that between a slave and his master? We'll leave the other illustrations. We're not all too familiar with the Roman society and so we can't compare. But can you imagine a greater difference? A starker reality and yet the peace of Christ should dwell among them. Let me give you a starker difference. One that is even in many ways less imaginable. Could there be a greater difference between a gloriously holy gracious God and us? And yet Christ established peace by the blood of his cross. And that peace should rule in our hearts as we relate to one another so that we are unruffled by those who do not satisfy our expectations or meet our even legitimate needs and we never feel threatened by another opinion or a contrary custom. To which peace you were actually called in one body. We were called to peace. That kind of peace. And we were called to peace in one body. What is the point of this in one body? Well, because there was conflict in the early church. There were Jews and Gentiles. And there were slaves and freemen. There were men and women. Uh, there were people from different cultures, different languages. And yet they were called in one body. It never occurred to Paul that the simple solution would be that we'll have a Messianic congregation and a, a Gentile congregation, that we'll have a uh, Korean congregation and we'll have a, a, an English congregation, that we'll have a Yankee congregation and a Confederate congregation, that we'll have a black congregation and a white congregation. We'll have a congregation that caters to the elderly and we'll have a congregation that caters to the young. We'll have all kinds of congregations that will meet all needs. Good grief, says Paul. These are denials of the gospel. You were called to peace in one body, and that means we need to work at it. Put on. We have no other choice. We were called in one body. My beloved friends, we've lost the sense of one body. It is so easy to divide. It's so easy to pick up and go. But it is so desperately wrong. The church is to be one. One. The church is a fellowship of grace and to which we belong on no grounds but grace. And all are to mesh and to clash and to be sanctified and to grow together as we worship God and grow as one body. We are to learn one another, to learn to love one another in spite of our differences. It is God's intention to gather all things up into one. This, Ephesians 1.10 tells us, is God's purpose for the fullness of time. To unite all things. Well, how can we divide then? He is doing that through the gospel. That is what we should be doing. Now, we all pay lip service to this truth, do we not? And sometimes, all too seldom, we react to the fences that our lazy preference for comfort and sinful pride has created. That's when we think that we're exemplary. And the truth is that we repeatedly betray the gospel by allowing those fences to exist 
by reinforcing them or raising them up. We should not be reaching over the fence. We should be like President Reagan as he stood before the wall in Germany and said, break this wall, tear this wall down. We are called into one body in order to exemplify this peace which transcends differences and gives expression to God's ultimate eschatological goal. The created of a sanctified, redeemed, united humanity that is God-centered. The restoration of Eden at the expense of conflict. And the church today is to be a visible enactment of the future when the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. And Christians can't lie down together. Shame on us. Paul's next injunction is, and be thankful. Let's put that in context. As God's chosen holy ones, and having been loved, put on great sympathy, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing one another and forgiving each other if anyone has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, you forgive as well. Above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, your hearts is plural there, to the which you, once again plural, were actually called in one body, and be thankful. Thankful for what? Thankful for being called. No, thankful for being called in one body. Thankful for the privilege of belonging to the church of Jesus Christ. Thankful for the grace that is the grounds of our membership. We do not need to learn another culture or another language or invent another program or alter our social standing or subscribe to a denominational confession. All who are in Christ are called in one body and nothing more is required. And to that end, says Paul, let the word of Christ indwell among you richly. It's a strange phrase. It's strange in Greek as well. The word of Christ is nothing else but the gospel. Not in the superficial way that we sometimes think of it, restricted to four things God wants you to know. The gospel is, I'm preaching the gospel to you right now. The gospel is the whole message of God. And that should be indwelling us. What should be indwelling us? The word of Christ. What do we look for when we come to church? What is the first thing? Is it the singing? Will it be contemporary or traditional? Is it this program or that program? Is it these kind of folk or that kind of folk? This language or that? This culture or that? Or do we come to church for God's sake in Christ? And the primary thing we seek is a faithful ministry of the Word of God, first and foremost as it is proclaimed from the pulpit, and then by the grace of God as it is lived out in the context of the church. Let the Word of the Christ indwell you richly. Next, the Word of Christ indwells amongst Christians which means that they should be engaged in teaching and admonishing yourselves with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Here is a solid standard for the church. There is, in fact, little, if any, difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Paul believes that singing does have an important role in the life of the church. It has to do with, surprising enough, teaching and admonishing. In other words, the primary feature of our hymnody should be the words. Not the melody, not the worship team, not what instruments we use, but the content. We can sing beautiful nonsense, and sometimes we can sing 
great truths poorly. The latter is far to be preferred to the former. Hymns should teach us. Hymns should admonish us. Hymns should be instruments of true prayer and adoration. Christian hymnody, should I dare say it, be theology put to music. It should inform us of our faith and it should challenge us. And how are we to sing? We are to sing, says Paul, with grace in your hearts, singing to God. The danger of a worship team is that they will perform. The danger of a worship team is that they will perform and the congregation will not sing. The danger is that the congregation will be measured by the quality of its that is its musical quality rather than by the warmth and the sincerity with which they croak. Better croak warmly than sing without grace in our hearts to the Lord. The word sing is in the plural. It's you folk sing because we sing as a community. We sing as a community to God, worshiping. And finally, says Paul, everything whatsoever you do, speaking to one another, or acting, that is doing, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, there's not a single sphere of life in which we are free from serving God or seeking to grow in grace and the knowledge of his ways, everything whatsoever when we speak to one another or avoid speaking. Whether it's washing dishes or teaching a Bible lesson or simply coming to church or singing a hymn or disciplining our children or obeying our parents, it should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. We should not aspire to go beyond him. We should not but relate all things we do to him. That is real spirituality. That is the height to which we should aspire. Everything in the name of Jesus with one important addition that Paul makes that brings us back in a full circle to Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Can we give God the Father thanks for our family life, for our church life? Or have we become so disenchanted because selfishly our expectations are not met, our felt needs are not met, are not satisfied, and are not likely to be? Or do we know in everything to give God thanks? Instead of complaining what is not, labor that it might be. So Paul has moved from heightened theology in the previous part of this letter to the practice that is so mundane, so pedestrian, that it touches me where I need to hear the gospel and I pray to God it will touch you where you need to hear the gospel. God is an eternal fellowship of persons. Harmonious, different from one another, but harmonious and happy. Each fulfilling his role within the Godhood. Man created in the image of God must live in harmonious fellowship with those with whom he differs. That is why salvation is in the Bible not exclusively framed in terms of individuals but in terms of communities, families, churches, nations. The whole world is in view. All creation is in view. And we have become in these modern days, and if you forgive me for saying, in your specifically American culture, so individualistic that we cannot distinguish between selfishness and spirituality. 
Spirituality has to do with how we relate to each other in the family, in church, and in society. Eschatology has to do with the whole world adoring God in Christ and submitting to his service. And Christians must live out their salvation in the various spheres of life to which they have been called. Adoring God in Christ and submitting to these his commandments. Let me try to summarize. God's love to us, apart from any unworthy or any worthiness on our part, in spite of the fact that we are unworthy, should move us, encourage us, and teach us to love others in the same way. To that end, we have been called and consecrated. Understanding this, we must put on humility, patience, forgiveness, all necessary for the kind of life we are to lead. Love is the perfect bond because it takes on all of these Christ-like characteristics, teaching us to give rather than to receive, teaching us to ignore failures, weaknesses, and distinctions. We are to live at peace with one another in one church and not seek peace by dividing. That is our calling because it is God's ultimate intention in Christ. That is Christian eschatology. Focus on Christ, not on ceremony. On the word of Christ, not on anything else. Not on ritual, not on angels, not on knowledge, not on programs, not on singing, not on physical comfort, but on the word of Christ. We should do all for God in Christ and should not be self-serving, not in our families, not in the church, nor in society. Salvation has to do with more than the individual. All creation it is of you, all of human society, to the glory of God. And the more we understand this, the more consistently, the more effectively, the more truly will we be able to live out the gospel. God has established these principles, and we should be living by them. Let us pray. You are the only wise God. You made the world and you have purposed its redemption through Christ. You will bring all things into subjection to Christ. You unite all things in him. Bring us to subjection to Christ in the here and now of our lives. Unite us in him. We adore you for your wonderful plan. We thrill at the thought of the, that the awful effects of sin will one day be undone and that the whole world will really be made subject to him. Lord, help us to put on. Help us to subject ourselves to him most willingly. Help us live with each other by focusing on him, your, your holy, glorious, beautiful, wonderful, beloved son. And teach us to love and to ignore what, what sin would use to divide. Teach us to relate to each other selflessly rather than seeking to meet our needs and to compete. God, give us grace to show grace. And by this manifest your sons present among us, we humble ourselves before you and we freely confess that we need your help. In Jesus' name, amen.